Uh, you know, normally we have a lot of announcements, but I really think that the topic we're going to be t uh, discussing and I'm hearing about is a very important one, so we're going to just kind of dispense with, with announcements. If there's anything that you need to share with the group, we'll talk about that at the end. I do want to say uh, I have been watching for a couple of years now um, from afar uh, this lady that seems to be so much like many of us, uh, kind of a rouser, rouser, you know, just out there, not really looking to make a problem, but sometimes seeing problems and thinking someone's got to deal, something, deal with this. And uh, if not us, who? And I'm sure that Helen said, if not me, who? And so um, I've, I've watched, and some of you have watched Helen Burns Sharp for a while uh, addressing some issues that she's going to tell us about here in our community. Um, and so I've always been an admirer of her, and then, of course, more recently I've had the opportunity to meet Helen, and, and we've uh, also begun to work together just on one issue that many of us share a common concern about, uh, and that's the issue of pilots and TIFs. Uh, you may have read the email I sent out about Helen, but uh, she um, has been engaged in city uh, state planning for many years. This took her from Chattanooga, and I don't know the exact order, but Chattanooga also, uh, Atlanta, and also Oregon, and uh, three great locations that has been able to give her tremendous experience and really to give her a great background to be able to speak about the topic tonight we're going to talk about. Uh, before she comes up though, let me just give you just a real quick about a two minute sketch or so of what's happened in the last week or two that uh, should have you concerned if you haven't been following it. In essence, uh, how many of you know what a pilot is, okay? Okay, of course, most people do, payment in lieu of taxes. And in just the last 30 days, our, our city and county have given away a million and a half dollars approximately worth of taxes to wealthy developers. Uh, the issue, there's a lot of issues that, of course, Ms. Sharp will talk about here in just a minute. But one of the issues that really bothered me about this issue is the fact that there's a fairness issue. Uh, you've got people that, in some instances, have got plenty of money, and yet they're asking for more of our money. And yet I see a lot of people, in fact, many here in this audience probably are small businessmen and women. You have your own business. And I'm, I'm be willing to uh, guess that you have never gotten a tax break from the city or county of any sort. Never a tax break from the IRS. Never a tax break from any taxing authority. And probably you really don't expect it, do you? You don't expect it. You don't go asking for it. You just know, here's the rules of the game, and I'll try to play within those rules. And yet, there's some people that, whether that's because they feel entitled, or whether because they're powerful, or whether because they're connected, or whether because whatever, they feel like they, they are able to go ask for exceptions from the rules. And that's what's happened the last couple of uh, weeks here in Chattanooga, and most, most specifically this week at the county commission were by a vote of six to three, uh, and I'm thankful that two of the three votes who voted against this most recent choo-choo pilot are here, Sabrina uh, Smedley and, and Tim Boyd. Uh, I'm thankful that they were here and they, they're here and they stood strong. The issue though, I, I will tell you, I don't know, I don't want to take a whole lot of Ms. Sharp's thunder, so to speak, but I do want to just say that one of the things that really disturbed me about the whole matter of the choo-choo pilot in particular is that it involved um, a former Chattanooga mayor. And uh, in and of itself, that raises a flag for me. But then when you begin looking at all the dotted lines and solid line connections of this man and his partners, for any prudent, halfway alert individual, you would start thinking, something doesn't look right here. And let me share a few of those dotted and solid lines. Uh, Mayor, there's an organization called River City Company, and this, this organization is the agency that is entrusted with going out and finding businesses that theoretically qualify for a pilot and bringing those businesses and projects to the city council and the county commission to propose that they give them these tax breaks. The River City Company is a very powerful company. It, uh, organization is made up of a board if you look at the board, the members of that board, those people are the movers and shakers of who's who of Chattanooga. 
That board is also comprised or made up of elected officials. In fact, four elected officials are on that board. Two mayors, our two, both Mayor Jim Coppinger and, and Mayor um, Andy Burke, as well as a county commissioner, Joe Graham, as well as a city councilman, Chip Henderson. So you've got uh, elected officials that are on the board of the company that are coming to the city council and the county commission recommending a yes vote and then those same people take their hat off of the board and they go stand or sit on the other side and they, they vote, in this case, typically yes for these projects. But, but what makes matters worse in the choo-choo pilot is um, the former mayor, John Kinsey, was also a board member of River City Company at one point. His partner, uh, Ken Hayes, was the former president of the River City Company. His other partner, Ben Probasco, his boss is on the board of the River City Company, or former boss. So you can see, in my mind, a very distinct uh, and clear, in my mind, incestuous relationship between the power brokers, the movers and shakers, that are all lined up on this board in this organization and all patent each other's on the back and all sharing our wealth, our taxes with each other. Uh, to me, something seems distinctly wrong. And um, so uh, this has certainly raised my dander a little bit as it has, I know, a number of you in this audience tonight. And some of you have already been speaking out. I know Bill Reeser has shared several articles with the paper. and. Uh, so I hope you'll listen to um, Ms. Sharp. She's going to have a great presentation and then open up at the end for a lot for Q&A as well. And uh, so uh, get your questions ready and uh, because you're going to get some great answers here tonight. And help me welcome Helen Sharp. I just wish I could be as articulate as Mark West. Uh, I do have my clock. I've been known to get carried away when I talk about this topic. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Um, and I, I definitely, I really hope you will have some, some questions at the end. First of all, I really do appreciate this opportunity. I, I realize that I haven't done that many presentations on this. I, I sit at my computer and I write letters to the editor and I do research and all. And when Mark invited me, I thought, oh my goodness. He asked me, was I going to use a PowerPoint? And I thought, you know, that's a good idea. But it never occurred to me. I knew it would stress me out if I tried to get into technology in addition to trying to figure out my talking points. Um, for about three years, I have been involved in Chattanooga as a public interest advocate and tax abatement sleuth, I believe someone called me. Uh, there are developers who have called me a lot worse things than that, which are some of the nicer things I've been called. So what I would like to do is give you some observations of, of the last three years of my life and tell you some, I think, some encouraging news, but also some next steps. And then, as I said, I really would like to, 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 to ask some questions. So, uh, let me start out with how I got involved in this. I was in uh, local government for 37 years. In the Chattanooga area, uh, with the Tennessee State Planning Office, I spent a lot of time in Marion County, where I met my husband. And then we, then I, after 16 years in the Southeast Tennessee area, I went to Cobb County in the Atlanta area, and then made a, a major change, and my husband and I moved to Oregon in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, I think Oregon is probably what ruined me, and I'm sure there are people in town that would like to raise money to send me back to Oregon, because <laughs> I learned what open government can be like, and what it's like to have policies and procedures that guide public decision making. So um, I wasn't looking for a, a cause at all, and, and I've told people if I were looking for a cause, I wouldn't have chosen this one. Uh, tax abatements are inherently complicated, convoluted, and boring to most of the world. I mean, when people see me at a social function, you know, they, they try to be pleasant and say thanks for good, the good work and all like that, but they don't want to hear me get started, and I don't blame them. You know, there's an acronym, MEGO, my eyes glaze over, and at times I see my own eyes glaze over when I start talking about this topic. 
But I think it's a really important topic uh, everywhere, but particularly for Chattanooga at this point in time. This all started with sort of a fateful cup of coffee that I had. I lived downtown. I'm what uh, I guess Commissioner Boyd would call an urbanite. And was, that, was that your term? And uh, enjoy living downtown. And, and um, I, I'm so, uh, it, it's interesting when I took this on, I wasn't you know, predisposed to be looking to take on the city and the county. I love Chattanooga. Can't believe all the changes that have happened. You know, glad to, to come back and all. I'm one who worked in government and I think government you know, can do a good job, can be efficient, can be very fair and all. And I now think government has a role in economic development. So I wasn't looking for a cause, but I saw something in the paper that said that the Industrial Development Board of the City of Chattanooga was considering tax increment financing for a development in the Lookout Valley area called Black Creek. Black Creek is a very nice golf course community. And apparently, the, the, I learned, the proposal was to divert some what would be taxpayer money that would be going into the city and the county and pay back the developers to build a road up Etna Mountain or what they call uh, Black Creek Mountain and what some others call Raccoon Mountain, just pick your name. So anyway, I, when I saw that we were, that this was Chattanooga Hamilton County's first TIF, Tax Increment Financing, TIF, I thought, well, this is interesting because i would had some experience with TIFs in my professional life in Oregon, and I thought they could be a useful tool. And so I thought, being kind of weird and liking public policy things, I thought, well, I'll just follow this. But I, you know, thought this would probably, you know, be fine or whatever. Well, when I started following it, I, you know, it had already gone to the Industrial Development Board, so the next step was the County Commission, and then the City Council. And what I learned right away is talk about the choo-choo being on the tracks. Boy, the, the Black Creek TIF train was on the tracks. And by the time the public really found out about it, you know, there had been a lot of lobbying by some well-connected uh, and, and, you know, good developers who contribute to the community, don't have any particular issue with them or whatever. But they had, you know, pretty much greased the skids. Chattanooga uh, did not have any policies and procedures to guide whether or not this was a good idea or not. And so nobody ever checked into such things as is the project eligible under state law and uh, what would happen if they don't live up to their commitments. And then when you looked at it kind of carefully, you found out commitments, they really didn't make any. I mean, in other words, in this thing where we, we approved $9 million in tax dollars, and we agreed to pay them 5.25% interest and to pay their attorney's fees and their architectural and engineering fees. And in return, uh, they said in their economic impact plan, we expect to build an ice cream parlor and a restaurant and uh, uh, senior uh, assisted living and, you know, some really kind of flaky things like that, nothing wrong with these things, but you typically think of a TIF as being in a blighted area where something is needed to really turn it around and it wouldn't develop without maybe some help from public funds. So that's the, the classic TIF, the sort of slums and blight TIF. Well, clearly this isn't that. And the other kind of TIF that we see some is the economic development one that relate to jobs. but. You know, normally you would think that would mean a couple of hundred of, you know, fairly high paying jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this was neither. And when you read the economic implement plan, you, you find that, you know, they don't even say they're going to do these. They say they expect to. And so it just seemed a little weird. And I was naive back then. I'm not naive anymore or as naive. And, and so I started writing emails to the county commission, which I'm still doing and uh, and to the city council and saying you might want to punch the pause button on this and and just you know ask a few more questions and if you do decide to uh, approve this TIF you know put some provisions in there that protect the public in case this doesn't go as planned these are called clawbacks 
So anyway, I, I thought those were fairly reasonable suggestions and all like that, but as I said, there was other than Deborah Scott, and actually on the, on the city council, I think Pete, Pete Murphy uh, was supported, and Andre McGarry, but uh, it was 9-0 on the county commission, and then um, the, the mayor Littlefield at the time was a fan of this project and all. And so anyway, it was sort of a done deal. So um, I recognize that you know, we elect people and we hope they use good judgment and have their facts and all, and then we respect the decisions they make even though we don't agree with them. And if we don't like the decisions and we try to influence them on future votes or try to you know, make policy suggestions and then there are elections. So, after this happened, I thought, well, I wish I'd gotten involved a little bit sooner, but I realized the decision had been made by the city and the county, but there was one final step, and that final step was for it to go back to the Industrial Development Board to approve the issuance of bonds. Well, at this point, that was a pretty much a formality. I recognize that, but I just wanted to go because I had been following this, and so I then tried to find out when is the Industrial Development Board likely to meet on this issue? When is this going to be back on their agenda? And this was my first, well, I had already had a few cues on this, but experience with sort of a lack of, of transparency and also arrogance involved in this project, in that I, I called the city attorney's office and said, do you know when it might be on the agenda? Because I was going to do some traveling and I had some flexibility. And he said he didn't know for me to call the bond council in Nashville who thought, and who did you say, you know, he said, who did you say you are and why are you calling me? And I said, well, the Chattanooga city attorney said call you. He said, you need to call the developer's attorney in Chattanooga. And that's Mike Mallon with Miller and Martin. So I called Mike and I just said, I was friendly, and I just said, I, you know, I've been following this. I just wanted to go to the meeting uh, and just wondered if you knew approximately when it was going to be on the agenda. And he said to me, do you have an attorney? And I was asking about if something was going to be on the agenda for a public meeting. Do you have an attorney? It had never crossed my mind to have an attorney. But when I hung up the phone, I thought, okay, you know, game on. Now, you know, about $100,000 later, you know, I think that's the most expensive phone call I, I ever made. But I thought, you know, what, what arrogance. So, you know, when a citizen is asking the question just about is something going to be on an agenda to get that sort of treatment, and, and, and I'd sort of gotten that kind of treatment from the, from the <coughs> city and the county as well. So anyway, uh, I did hire an attorney. I was fortunate I hired a very good one. This is interesting because this is the power structure. Most attorneys in town would not want to sue the city and the county. And, you know, these developers are prominent and all like that. So the fact that I got someone, his name is John Convalinka, uh, who is willing, I mean, someone said it was the watchdog meets the bulldog. So anyway, we, uh, uh, we, we went to that Industrial Development Board meeting that happened in October. This is 2012, so this has been going on about three, three years. And um, they, they did approve it, but there was a condition added because our point was that we didn't think it was eligible under state law. Not that we didn't like it and thought it was bad public policy, well, you know, those were true, but we didn't think it met the definition under state law. So anyway, they attached a condition saying that they needed to have an unqualified opinion from bond counsel stating that it was eligible. So what happens is, on, uh, fast forward about three or four months to Valentine's Day 2013, they closed on the project. And, but they had not had a meeting. And so, so who made the decision that they had an unqualified opinion? Uh, and what had happened was the bond council in Nashville, whom the developers were paying $50,000, he wrote a letter saying that he thought it was eligible. Well, you know, this is the, you know, the, the, here again, this kind of coziness and conflict of interest or whatever. So anyway, after, after that happened, uh, I filed a lawsuit uh, alleging that, you know, that it was an ineligible um, uh, expenditure of public funds, but also that there had been a violation of the State Open Meetings Act in that the decision was made 
but the decision was not made at a public meeting and there was not a vote. In other words, what they could have done and should have done is had a public meeting, had this letter from this guy that had a conflict of interest and voted on it, which they would have done because the bond boards are typically rubber stamps here. And, but they didn't do that. They just went ahead and approved it without a meeting. So anyway, so, so I filed a lawsuit on that and then last summer, uh, the chancellor ruled that the Black Creek TIF was null and void uh, due to, he, and he was just, and we wanted actually to get to the issue of is it eligible under state law, because that's really the legal issue. But he didn't let us get to that because he was so irritated about violations of the, of the Sunshine Law and the Open Meetings Act and the, and the conflict of interest. And he basically said, well, wait a minute, you know, you have the guy who's getting paid if it closes and he's the one that's writing the letter saying yeah looks good to me he said it's like asking the inmates at the jail whether or not they think the, the cell should have locks or not so anyway felt, felt good about that but knew that this was a narrow issue and they were not going to give up on their you know they thought it was their nine million dollars plus interest or whatever so and, and then what happened was really, I think, pretty, pretty sad and, and pretty appalling, and that is that it, it immediately got sent back to the City Industrial Development Board. And the administration either was calling the shots or was influencing that, but, and the city attorney who used to work for Miller and Martin, talk about some more of this incestuous thing or whatever, and then the mayor's chief of staff used to work at Miller and Martin. And Miller and Martin were the developer's attorneys, remember? So anyway, this immediately goes back to the Industrial Development Board, and yes, they have a public meeting, and yes, they asked for public input, and people showed up and all, but they had a couple of attorney-client meetings, which are exempt from the Sunshine Law, but they're not supposed to do any deliberation and make a decision there. So they come back into open meeting and they vote uh, to reapprove it. I call it putting a mandate on it. And they did not have any discussion or any deliberation whatsoever, none. And so they, they reapproved this thing. And so it just infuriated me. And the only solution was to file another lawsuit, which is not exactly what I needed. But I thought, you know, they're not gonna get away with this because I think there were open meetings violations, open records violations, more conflict of interest. This time, they had the city attorney write the letter, and the city attorney, who was no longer the city attorney, he also kind of, even though he was a city employee, he got a bonus check after the, the TIF closed. So he had a conflict of interest, too. So anyway, so that's what happened there, and, and so that was back in August, and this is still, it's very confusing in the, the original lawsuits at the Court of Appeals, the new lawsuits in Hamilton County Chancery Court. I know this is more information than, than you care to hear, but it, it just shows how complicated these things are and how lawsuits should be a last resort because they take forever and, and they cost a fortune. But sometimes when it doesn't work in the political arena and you feel, feel real strongly about it, 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 is a, it, it is an option. So anyway, so while this was happening, and, and, uh, and this will be coming back fairly soon, uh, to uh, the, the, the TIF will start to heat up a bit. Um, but in the meantime, um, I guess I was just so used to dealing with these tax abatements, I, had, uh, I, I imagine most of you in this room know Deborah Scott, and uh, Deborah Scott had told me when, we, when the topic of pilots came up, uh, be very careful if you take this on because you know we have one TIF and we have over 50 companies with pilots and we have like 10 board members of the Chamber of Commerce whose companies have pilots and so you know I've been told by people uh, you know speak truth to power uh, but recognize that you've kicked the hornet's nest on this one. So, you know, I'm not exactly real popular with, with a lot of people, uh, but I think that the, the same issue, it, the, the, the thing that is to me so frustrating and the common theme about the, the pilots and the TIF is that in most communities, number one, you do it within government. And what we have done in Chattanooga over the years is we have privatized our entire economic development program. 
So the chamber runs it for jobs, and River City runs it for downtown development. These are not bad organizations. They work hard. They have some really good people. But their job is to represent private interests. Nothing wrong with that. But they are the ones doing the negotiating. And who do you think, when they're working with the company's attorneys, which is usually Miller and Martin, uh, you know, they're going to try to protect their interests. So they're not going to want to put in a lot of clawback language and all like that. And th the public is not part of this. And also understand when these negotiations happen at the chamber in River City, they're not under the sunshine law. Their meetings aren't open to the public. The records are not open to the public. Isn't that cozy? So what happens is, though, that the everything that really it's the d distinction between formal and informal power that theoretically the county commission and the city council make decisions on pilots and tips right but really those decisions are made before they ever get to the county commission and to the city council they're made at the chamber or they're made at river city and the mayors are a part of this and uh, we'll, we'll get, get into that a little later because that's that sort of revelation that I sort of discovered. So the, the solution is policies and procedures. I mean, it is really interesting. Go on the web and Google Memphis Pilot Program, and you will see a very well thought out program uh, with uh, an application, with criteria. They really try to get at you know, 50% of median income, we choose to go with the absolute highest we can and then charge those people the absolute highest rent we can because that's what we're concerned about is the developer's profit. We're not really concerned about the low and moderate income people, it would seem. So we have models. We have models like on TIFFs, like Knoxville basically says, you know, you they require, the, the, a big thing to me is something called the but-for test where it seems to me like the two fundamental things are that anyone wanting ta a taxpayer subsidy needs to be able to demonstrate that it's a, a, a there's a strong, substantial public benefit and that this subsidy is needed to make the project happen. So like, for example, in Knoxville, they have a provision where they ask the applicant for a tip to sign an affidavit that says without this money, I wouldn't do the project. You start looking at some of the companies we've given pilots for. I mean, the Unum parking garages, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Chatham, Coca-Cola over and over again, Southern Champion Tri over and over again. And, and these all go under the radar screen. You know, they, they get one and then it expires and then they get another one. So some people have been on almost a perpetual pilot. Now, can you, do you think, thinking about these, do you really think that Chatham is going to pick up and move, or if we hadn't paid for the Unum parking garages, that they would have moved their corporate headquarters and moved those garages to Connecticut? I don't think so. It's just that, as Mark says, they know about this program. They're well connected. This sort of goes in under the radar screen, and we all get, since we don't have any policies and procedures, we get into this thing about, oh, you know, we like you know, that used to be Provident, yeah, I know somebody used to work there, and Coca-Cola, well, you know, it was founded here. And so we start basing decisions based on that, and it, it's, you know, when we're dealing with, with the people's money, it, it's not, you know, it, we need to base it on public benefit and whether or not it's really needed. And Rick Ebersole, who was on the City Industrial Development Board, said he thought what we ought to do is have an application right now for the jobs pilots at the chamber. I don't think there's even an application form. But let's say there's an application form and, a, a, and a, an application fee, and his suggestion is that we need to use that money to hire an independent professional, it could be a CPA, it could be an attorney or whatever, to do a cost-benefit analysis. Because some of these things, you know, might be good and are worthwhile. And, you know, we, we, let me say this about Volkswagen, it's the one we always hear about, and, and I think rightly so, in that that was a game changer. I mean, it, it could have gone somewhere else. The competition had tax incentives. I, they might have come here anyway, but we couldn't take that chance. So they got a huge tax in, in, incentive. 
But one of the reasons when we gave them that, that we said is, well, they're going to be bringing in satellites. They're going to be a catalyst for others. And, and this is true. They have. We have three you know, companies that have located here because of Volkswagen. Well, guess what? We've given all of them pilots. Even though before we approve the pilots, it's already on the company websites that they are locating in Chattanooga, Tennessee because they want to be near Volkswagen. That's why they're here. And so it's just nuts. It's kind of like, you know, it's 50 years ago and, and we feel like we've just got to give away the farm and that nobody's going to come here or we aren't going to have any housing built if we don't just give things away. It's, it's, it's just, it's crazy. But then what happens, and, and the, the elected officials, I think, can echo this, particularly on the ones that involve jobs, that, you know, jobs are so important, and we all know that, but this isn't saying you don't want those jobs. What we've tended to do, I think, is we've confused sort of recruitment with tax breaks, like they're one and the same. And, uh, a website you might find really interesting is called uh, goodjobsfirst.org. And it's a, it's a nonprofit, a guy named Greg Leroy uh, uh, is the, the head of it. But he's done a lot of really good research. And what he says is that in most instances, the, the tax break is the icing on the cake. When they come to your community, they know where they want to be. They're going to be here anyway. But of course, if they can, I mean, you can't fault them for asking and saying, we would like a tax break, or do you have an incentive package? And if you don't, you know, really drill down and maybe go on the web and find out that their corporate headquarters has already said they're going to locate here anyway, you know, then then we 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 give it to them. And 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 his and another point he makes, I think, is really telling. He says that a a business makes a, dis, uh, a decision on where to locate based on um, markets, based on labor force, based on transportation. They make a business decision. Okay, and that the uh, in terms of uh, the ranking of you know the factors that influence where they locate taxes, I don't even think state and local taxes are even in the top ten. And when you look at you know, he's got some IRS data that says when you look at what businesses spend their money on, it's like two percent state and local taxes. Well, contrast that with Hamilton County and the city of Chattanooga, where well over. 50% of our property tax revenues come from property taxes. So this is a big deal, and, 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 and I think Tim was really, really uh, you know, articulate a couple of weeks ago about, you know, are we just putting up a sign saying tax-free zone or whatever? It almost seems like that. And, and you know, and, and I, I, I think the people that are, I still want to think, making these decisions are well-intended, but this, this choo-choo thing and, and the walk to campus thing is, is puzzling. Okay, let me see. You got plenty of money. All right, okay, thank you. Do you need some water? Uh, yeah, water would be, be good, thank you. So that's my story, and thank you. Um, I have got some observations about this, and, and I, I tend to be kind of an optimist and try to see, see the good, and, and uh, you know, the, but this is, and I still want to, and I still hope to, that we can work our way through this. But anyway, I did some research, and um, it is on, where is it? I think it was on the Times Free Press website, that I, it, was, it is so hard to get information, particularly on the pilots, because it's housed all sorts of different places. I don't think it was necessary they were trying to keep information from people. I mean, the, the county commissioners, couldn't get this in. They never had this information. Some of it's with the city. Some of it's with the county. Some of it's at River City. Some of it's with the chamber. There was no central clearinghouse. And so what I did, I wanted to be really sure I, that I had my facts right because I knew that there were people out there that would love for me to make a mistake and get a decimal point in the wrong place and so they could say, bless her heart, you know, she means well, but, you know, she needs to clip coupons and do things that retirees are supposed to be doing, you know, whatever, <laughs> not, not deal with this. So, but anyway, I feel, I feel good, and I have a spreadsheet, if you'd like to see it, business by business, that shows that in 2014 alone, we forgave 26 
million dollars in property taxes. And this is combined city and county, and most places are paying school taxes now, but some aren't. That's a fairly recent addition. So $26 million for one year. And remember that most of these pilot agreements are 12 years or so, and Volkswagen and Amazon and some of the big ones are like 30 years. Alstom, which has just made some major layoffs and is not meeting what they're, what, and it's a wonderful company in terms of a, a good, good paying jobs and all, but they basically said they were gonna invest X amount and employ X number of people. I believe they recently laid off, I don't know if it was 100 or 150. Well, are we gonna do anything about it? It's actually up to the city and the county because we have such waffle wording in these agreements, but it does say the city and county may, but certainly don't have to, uh, you know, uh, talk to these companies and yeah, at least cut off the tax break. I mean, if in fact Austin is not meeting its commitments, then why are we giving them a tax break for the next 10 years? And their tax break amounts to about $2 million a year. The total package was $30 million. So anyway, I mean, we need, we, we don't have much in the way of clawback language, but this is a sort of hinting over here to the elected officials. Let me, we might let me look interject at just real quick. The reason I've been given that we don't want to put pressure on, and I brought up Austin in particular with the mayor's office. Well, we don't want to put any more pressure on Austin if we go trying to get our taxes back, they just might pull out all together. I said, let them go. <laughs> I mean, we're not getting it anyway. So they don't want to step on the toes of those not performing because that's going to burden them more, which I don't think is a good excuse. Um, Harrison went bankrupt. We lost out everything on that. Well, absolutely, and that was an interesting thing. That's kind of a wind tunnel subsidiary or whatever. But somehow or another, that pilot kind of got switched to Alston. I mean, it's real. Yeah. It's cozy. I mean, yeah, the relationship right. there. And they said they went bankrupt, but guess what? They're still operating a plan in Houston or something. So, but but we don't ever pursue it. I don't think we have ever pursued anybody, even though I believe the chamber gives reports to elected officials or to a committee or whatever. And I think a few years ago, the one that I saw maybe of the 15 companies that had commitments relative to jobs and investment, maybe three had met their commitments. So it's kind of like wink, wink, you know, we'll, we'll try to do this, but they know that if they don't, they're gonna get away with it. You know, it's, it's, it's bad, okay. So I think the reason that this is bad is because of sort of the two things. One, tax equity, like Mark was pretty eloquent about saying, we pay our taxes. We pay our taxes in years where the economy may be bad or we have maybe have medical expenses or whatever, but we pay them. And, and so there's this fundamental fairness issue. I think there's also a social justice dimension to this, that we've got such needs in this community and that you know, really, you know, $26 million from the people, really, with the, the most ability to pay. Uh, you know, these are Fortune 500 companies. Did you know that CBL at Hamilton Place got a pilot to build an office building for EMJ? I mean, these are incredibly successful companies. I mean, you know, it, it's just, this just isn't right. And, and I think a lot of times, maybe when newly elected officials come in, they, they just inherited the system, maybe that the, they don't want to appear dumb, everybody gets excited just when the chamber walks in the door and says, uh, you know, jobs and all like that. Well, we're all for jobs, but we can get jobs without giving away property taxes. That's, that's what we've sort of got to, got to work on here. Okay, so we don't have criteria, we don't have an application form, we have very little monitoring. Have you noticed how anytime people come to the defense of pilots, they mention Volkswagen. Do you ever hear them mention any other pilot? I don't. Okay. And so my whole theme is nobody seems to be looking out for the public interest. And uh, let's see. Um, I wonder, particularly in the case of the mayors, and maybe this is true of some commissioners and counselors, is some of it sort of 
bragging rights. I mean, in other words, we all like to see new jobs come in, and I get that. And elected officials who have got so much on their plate that's not very much fun, and and and, and all. It's it's nice to be at a ribbon cutting and to announce new jobs. I get that. But really, what our elected officials need to be doing is doing what they are doing in terms of making this a place where businesses want to locate, of having the infrastructure, of having the quality of life. You know, they still can brag. They can brag every bit as much. In fact, I would think they could brag more if we get a job announcement and we're not getting a tax break. <laughs> but I think that's a little bit of it, that they, they want to be able to brag on well, you know, we, we, we got this and all like that. And, and I think they have, somebody uh, talked about the chamber of Kool-Aid, but I think that they have, they have been drinking it a little bit and, that, and they may sincerely believe that these, these tax breaks are necessary. But I, I just, as I've said, don't think they are. Uh, another, you know, I mentioned how we've privatized it and another sort of unfortunate thing is we really don't have staff in either the city or the county that really is trained and enough or would be bold enough to try to interject this. Where I came from, part of my job would be to write a staff report, to try to frame the issues, to recognize the elected officials and the policy makers, I'm staff, but try to identify things. And so they would have all the information. We don't do that here. We kind of leave it up to the city and county attorneys and they're getting their marching orders from the mayors and from the chamber and all like that. So nobody's kind of really looking at all of this. And so, you know, I, I know this kind of a, a sad thing at, at, at the county commission meeting when we had the special meeting, I really applaud the county for having a special session to take public comments on the housing pilot program. But it was very interesting that I don't know who it was, whether it was the chair of the committee or whether, whether it was uh, uh, Chairman Fields, who told the staff, it's okay for you to leave now. So, you know, think about if we were going to be dealing with potholes on Hamilton County streets. We'd have probably had 15 staff people in there, right? Because they're staff and they're involved with highway maintenance and potholes. We're talking about economic development and giving away a million and a half dollars there's no one with the county that's charged with that responsibility. And even on this pilot, when we started talking about now who's going to do the income verification to see if these people are low and moderate income? Well, you know, somebody said, well, maybe it'd be the assessor's office. And somebody said, well, maybe it'd be the, the, the you know, the trust students. Or, or, or maybe, maybe it'd be the finance department or whatever. And I think Mayor Cotton said that we'd figure it out. You know, well, that, that's great. You know, but that just shows how seriously we're taking it. And you don't do it on the back end. You know, I think they're going to be submitting tax, uh, income rolls. Well, you need to be checking on income at the very beginning. Because the only reason we can get these tax breaks for housing based on state law is because of low and moderate income persons. And we need to document that on the front end, not a year later. So well, here's some information that they submitted. Uh, you know, it, it's just it's just totally bizarre. Okay, uh, cozy relationships we've talked about, encouraging news. I, I think by and large the local media has covered this pretty well, and they get a lot of flack. I mean, you know, you know these folks are pretty influential, and I don't think the power structure are, are, is inherently bad. And I think a lot of I think there's a strong ethic in Chattanooga of people who have done well in business of giving back to the community. We see that with the aquarium. Um, so, but, so, but it's hard, I would imagine, for the local newspapers because, you know, these people are potential advertisers and things like that. So I think given the climate we function in, that they've been pretty, pretty fair about this. Uh, just recently, uh, there was an article, this is Sunshine Law Week, and, and somehow or another the Associated Press picked up on what I was doing in Chattanooga, and so they did an article that went out on the wire service and was picked up in Seattle and the New York Times and San Diego and all like that. About and It was interesting, it said, Chattanooga woman takes on City Hall. Yeah, didn't, didn't mention the county. Apparently, the, the city's the, the one they were focused on. 
Uh, the Wall Street Journal called me out of the blue and said they wanted to do a story on this. And so, you know, this is kind of interesting that these folks think this is significant, but you wouldn't know, boy, you know, I would, I'll give the county high marks for at least having a little bit of a debate about this. The, when the city approved the housing pilot, I've never seen anything so well orchestrated in my life. I mean, if, if someone were there giving Academy Awards, I mean, this was, it was, it was just amazing. I mean, everybody kind of knew ahead of time, and, you know, that, you know, what, what was going to happen on that one. I, I, I don't quite understand that. But, but anyway, I'm not saying there were any violations or anything, but it was, it was kind of like, and then at the very end, one of the counselors said, if there's any, after they had all announced they were going to approve it, basically, uh, they said, would anyone like to speak, you know, like, you, you know, really, you know, I mean, I was there, I didn't, but it's like, you know, you're just going through the motions here. You don't want to hear what I have to say. You, you never have for the past couple of years. <laughs> and, and the city likes to, likes to use the excuse, we're in a lawsuit, and we are. But that's Black Creek, and, and we were talking about pilots, and in particular, the Choo Choo Pilots. Um, okay, I was talking about good things. Locally, there's, there's a lot more awareness about this issue. And I think we have some momentum right now. And that is, I think it's so critical, as much as I would like just to let go of this, and, and particularly with my lawsuit heating up again and all, but this is so critical that we do the best job we can to try to, to, try to right the ship here. Um, and I think there's a recognition. Uh, Commissioner Beck told me after at a meeting last week, he said, I'll tell you this, Ms. Sharp, you're one tough cookie. And uh, I don't know what Commissioner Beck may have called me in addition to being a tough cookie, but I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, another positive thing, you know, we, we need to hang in there. And we, meaning, the, I think one of the very best things about this experience for me is you know, sort of, um, someone said we're holding hands across ideological lines, that we've got people that don't agree on everything and sometimes don't agree on very much of anything, but we agree on this. And, and I think this is so cool because we don't find that many things, it seems like we've become so polarized in our politics. But I mean, you know, with the Tea Party, the, the, the moderates in the middle, some of the folks uh, that are working with organizing the people that, that live in public housing, everybody sort of sees this the same way. I mean, and they see it from an equity standpoint and a social justice standpoint. So I think we need to take advantage of that. Uh, I think that's very much positive. Um, next steps, uh, I remember I'm showing my age here, but back in the late 60s there was this expression if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And so what, you know, I was trying to think, as I said, much as I'd sort of like to, uh, and I would in many ways, like to pass this torch, and it's so exciting to see all the people who are very smart, smarter than me, and have energy around this issue, getting, getting more involved in it. But what I thought I might do is maybe just convene a little informal meeting of a few people uh, and kind of say, okay, you know, we've got other models out there. I've done a fair amount of work about what I think policy and procedures might be. Is there any way we could agree on something and maybe even take a, a housing pilot agreement and come up with a standard housing pilot agreement where we get good wording for callbacks, where we protect the public interest, where we don't just say in the resolution, this benefits the public, let's explain how it benefits the public. And so, you know, there, 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 there's some things that, that we, we could do. So that's kind of what I was thinking might be a next step, at least with me. And then, you know, what would be interesting if this, if we were to come up with something, then the people who are involved in this sort of small group kind of thing then could take it back. I mean, if it were somebody like from this group who might work on this, they could bring it back to a Tea Party meeting and say, what do you think, or whatever. And then, so it, so it could have some organizational backing as well as individual backing. Now, I will say that right now I'm a little despondent and depressed because it just, you know, it seems like that many of our elected officials have, have got hearing loss right now, and, and uh, maybe that's what we need money for, is to get them hearing aids and stuff. I mean, I would think that this would be persuasive to them. 
if we come up, and, and this wouldn't be radical. I mean, this would just be really, honestly, what most places are doing anyway. Um, so I would like to think they would say, well, look at this. You know, there are people from all across the community who've agreed on this. And, yeah, this makes sense. This is reasonable. This is not that far out. Why don't we do that? But my experience recently has been, you know, it's, it, it's just, there is just such a resistance to looking at this. And, 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 and I can't totally put my finger on it, but it, it's, it's, it's just a little strange right now. But anyway. Um, I need to, um, oh, another thing too that I think those of us who've been involved in this have been doing, we've been focused on the elected officials because they have to vote one way or the other. So they're, um, they're on the hot seat. But let's remember that it's the mayors in the county and in the city that sort of set the agenda for the commission and the council and they sort of set the tone. Mayor Coppinger, whom I like, how can you not like Jim Coppinger? But he said before the little special session on pilots, he just said, now we gotta be careful here. These pilots are really important to us. Well, you know, in, in other words, so if there might have been any county commissioner that was undecided and the mayor, you know, says, you know, these, this is a really important tool and we ought to use these all the time, almost automatically, you know. So uh, I don't think there's been much lobbying. I'm not sure how you get to Andy Burke. I think you could, probably get the point with President Obama easier than you could make for but and not that I've tried, but he, he could contact me and, and ask him or whatever. I think Mayor Coppins is probably a little more accessible. So anyway, uh, a couple of plugs. Um, my website, uh, HelenBurnSharp.com, has, it's, I say, it's got some summary information of what I've been going over. Uh, it's got also stuff that would help you go to sleep at night if you've got insomnia. I mean, I really get into the, into the weeds there, so it's good for that. Um, it also sort of explains about my financial situation, which is not, not very positive. It's, uh, I've called it a financial pre pre precipice, but I am supposed to get the recovery of some attorney's fees, and that could happen in the next couple of months. Not all of them, but anyway, the, the city challenged that course so it's taken a while so uh, that plug also um, I'm on the board of an organization called the Tennessee Coalition for Open Government and this is Sunshine Law Week and I brought a little brochure uh, that I think we all get a little confused about the Sunshine Law and open meetings open records what kind of notice is necessary and all like that so there is a book that you can order but you can also download this and tcog.info and it's, it's just a, a nice resource and I think uh, I can show you the brochure I wish the city and county would spring for it and get all the commissioners and counselors and staff a copy of this book but I think also citizen activists would be interested in it too and then I mentioned earlier uh, goodjobsfirst.org particularly the section on account of, uh, accountable development and that also is a reminder too that this problem isn't unique to us. Uh, this is a problem throughout the country. So, you know, sometimes I, on the one hand, I think I, I'm coming on too hard here locally, but most places have some checks and balances. Most places have application forms and some policies and procedures. So, I mean, we, we I think, are sort of the poster child for how not to do it. But I'm, d I'm not wanting to represent that this is this is unique to us. So anyway, thank you for your indulgence, and I hope there's still time for some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Bill. Ellen, <clears throat> I'd like to preface my question with a reminder that everybody here probably is acquainted with. We face somewhat the same dilemma of coercive government by the Can you speak years. up a little bit? Yes, yeah. 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 I just want to remind everybody that uh, before I ask a question of Helen, that uh, they all remember that we faced the same coercive uh, government bureaucracy five and a half years ago when it started out at Westview Elementary School with the mayor and the power brokers of Chattanooga, the most of the leaders basically said we have the right as only one of three states in the, in the country that did it. We can take you into the city by force 
rather than let you vote on your own property tax increase, which was, was annexation. Uh, one of the people that formed that board, uh, uh, we were definitely underestimated by the city and the county. And uh, one of the people that formed that committee or board, Hamilton County Residents Against Annexation, were eight people that raised the money, held the meetings, went to the legislature, and got eventually, because of our efforts to raise that money and file, file 12 lawsuits, we stopped Littlefield from annexing us in the county and with the help of, if we hadn't done that, we probably wouldn't have got the, the help of a great guy, Mike Carter, and also Bo Watson that took the, the, the issue before the state legislature the first time in Tennessee's history. We were able, with them, to get the law passed that you cannot be annexed in Tennessee anymore without getting the vote of the people that want to be annexed. Well, I preface that question to Helen by saying, we have gone, some of us have gone to this, this meeting of the county commission, just like we did with the city council. We talked to them till we blew in the face, and it was like, as she recognizes, they'd already made up their mind before we talked to them, just giving us public time to solve, to uh, justify their vote and having let us speak. Nobody was listening. Yesterday, when we went to that county commission meeting, we had a vote taken on a project, as Helen will remind everybody, that says that a former mayor is going to be given $36,000 in tax abatement per year for his own investment project that hasn't been updated and renovated in 23 to 24 years. And yet, one of the Med County Commissioners had the, the audacity to say, well, this is not giving away any tax money. Besides, if we don't give it to them, I've talked to several developers throughout the state who have said if it weren't for tax abatements that you're going to offer us, we could go to Nashville and Knoxville and other cities and get a better deal. Well, I remind, I'd like to remind those folks that Lindsay's project is the Chattanooga Choo Choo. It's already here. We're not talking about future development. We're talking about projects that's here that's nothing but a boondoggle to pay for his renovations at the expense of the public. And who's going to bear that burden when the tax increases come? It'd be you and I in the public. So uh, his argument didn't hold water. And thank goodness for, for uh, Tim Boyd spending 20 minutes rebutting every argument they had for it with facts and figures, not just rhetoric, facts and figures, not one. Not one commissioner spoke up to rebut anything that Tim said that proved that this did not make sense, giving away tax money to a mayor and other folks who were not going to close the the choo-choo if they didn't get $36,000 in tax abatement on a multi-million dollar project right in the hotbed of activity and business development in Chattanooga. Just like Helen said, these projects are just awarded by the Good Old Boys Club. When you've got people on the county commission that are part of the River City Group, you've got Jim Coppinger, who in my opinion can't stand up and support our position on this because he was given his position as fire chief by the very man asking for this money and then he, he retired rather than get fired by Littlefield who knew was going to come after him. Yeah. So you've got to be aware of that. Okay. Did, did you have a question for us? So my question is, <laughs> I almost got away. my question is, Helen, are we at that point where all the talking we are going to do and have done in the past with these politicians is of no avail and we need to get out there and raise money to file a lawsuit to stop it? I don't think so. I think there's a political solution. I think uh, lawsuits are last resorts. I think most of our issues are really public policy issues rather than legal issues. And I guess I want to be optimistic that, that if we can get this coalition, if we can come up with sort of something constructive and, and present it and, and, you know, hang in there, that maybe there are going to be a few more come over to our side. And I want to say about the, the, the Mayor Kinsey project is, I mean, everybody loves the choo-choo. As far as I know, John Kinsey's a good guy and all like that. And see, this is what happens when you don't have policies and procedures. You start basing your evaluation on that. And we heard about the new tax dollars, but did we, did anybody ever say that right now it's hotel rooms and they pay sales tax? Mm -hmm. He converts it to residential, that doesn't pay sales tax. 
There's nothing written in the agreement that would keep him from turning it into extended stay motel when he's getting the tax break because of affordable housing. And I'm sorry, I'm, you know, I'm trying to be positive. I think we need to be civil. I think we need to have a positive tone. I think we need to recognize, I really still believe that elected officials are trying to do what they think is right. This is a complicated issue. They're hearing things you know, from lots of different people. Uh, they're not listening to us right now, enough of them on this issue, but I'd like to think we can turn this around. I, but I don't think this is lawsuit material because you really need to have a real legal issue, a cause of action, they call it. And, uh, you know, this is really, this is a, a political issue. And I think it's one that if we hang in there and work together, that, that we can change the dynamic here in China. Yes. Well, can I ask what the final approval uh, authority is for a pilot? Is that the city and the county, can, the city council, and the county commission? This is a little strange. Uh, it, it used to be that it was the, the county commission, the city council, and then it would go back to the bond board. And in the case of housing, that's the Health, Education, and Housing Facilities Board. In the case of jobs, it's the Industrial Development Board, which may be the city or the county. We've got two of those. What they have done in this new program, and I haven't figured out why, they now have a new first step where they send it to this bond board first. So John Kenzie's already been to this bond board, and it was unclear to them, I think, what their role was, and no one explained it because they have no staff, and the city attorney is certainly, he's just part of the good long gang. And, but basically, they were asked to recommend the application to the city council and the county commission, which makes no sense at all. But anyway, so, so they did that. But now, to answer your question, we've got that weird first step. Uh, so it's here. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, so then, then the, the, the next step is, okay, it's been to the, the City Council, the County Commission, it goes back to this bond board. And as much as I don't like rubber stamps, this is the stage where normally it would be a rubber stamp because these volunteers would say, this has been to the policy makers, they have approved it, our job is to act as a bond board and accept this property. Uh, I have a feeling, uh, I was the one that sort of blew the whistle both on the Industrial Development Board and the Health and Health Education and Housing Board that they had expired members, they had members that lived outside the city limits, which is in violation of state law. And so anyway, we have a new sort of cast of characters. And I think we have some better people. I mean, you know, we don't have, I think we had some brain dead people on the Industrial Development Board when, when Black Creek got approved. But I think there is some hope at the same time, the old members, I mean, they're, they're not used to asking questions. As I said, they have no staff. The city attorney uh, works for the mayor and the mayor seems to like this project. And so, but I would say stay tuned and it wouldn't hurt if there were a lot of people to show up at that bond board meeting. Uh, I really think that because, I mean, I think some of these new people are going to want to make a good decision and, and you know, and, and no one's going to explain to them either what their role is. I guess if one of them asks, it'll be that, well, the, the policymakers have approved this, you just pass the resolution and then you, you, you know, you take title to this property. I've been real interesting on the Choo Choo because since there are a lot of things going on at the Choo Choo, when this was going to the county commission and when it went to city council, there was an exhibit that showed what the bond board was taking title to in order for it to be tax exempt. It was blank. That only got added yesterday. So in other words, I was a little bit concerned about, well, are we taking title to the comedy catch and the new music venues and some of the other kind of stuff? I mean, can you imagine approving something, saying you're taking title to something and you don't know what it is, it refers to Exhibit A, and Exhibit A is blind. 
So, uh, you know, so what, what, to answer your question, I'm sorry, long, long story, but it does, it does have to go back to the bond board. Uh, and I think maybe that, you know, we, we sort of pack the city hall there and give, I know there's some of the mem new members of the bond board that really want to do the right thing, that think this, this housing pilot program is, is flawed, but they're not the ones that adopted it. That was the, the city council and the county commission. But I think there's still an opportunity, at least to make a little bit more progress here, but we might want to kind of work together on what's the message. Now, I think I should speak loud enough, but are you saying that it comes from various entities, River City, Chamber, goes to the city council and the county commission, they make a vote, and then it goes back to this, you say bond board, you talking about the industrial development board? Industrial development board for jobs, and so that like Volkswagen, and the health, education, and housing facilities board for housing. But the city council and the county commission could stop it there if they chose no, because I mean they, they have they have voted and they have said, you know, by a majority vote that they think this is this is good and that this bond board should take title to it. But if they voted against it, then would it stop? Well it's it would be fascinating. Who knows what that would mean? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and and we need to start being careful before we take the title of these properties to protect ourselves. We've been reading about Wrigley. Uh, the, the fires, the accidents at Wrigley, they make what, candy or chewing gum or all toys or whatever. Well, the county owns that. The County Industrial Development Board owns that. Well, I hope we've got some wording in these pilot agreements holding the, the county harmless for the loss of life, for the fires, et cetera, like that. I mean, this is the kind of thing if somebody was paying attention to the public interest that would be in there. Hopefully it is, but that's just an example. Yeah, but then my point though would be, has a pilot ever been rejected? It's been Absolutely, and in fact, I don't believe that, a, that the terms of a pilot until very recently have ever even been discussed. So it's a done deal. By, by well, they never before have they been discussed by the elected officials. That's starting to change. And the bond board, they have just been totally automatic. But then when I questioned them on that on a, on a jobs pilot, they said, one of a, a fairly bright new member said, well, you know, our job is to act as a bond board. We ought to be able to assume that this has been vetted by the people elected to make policy decisions. Yeah, see, I'm troubled that officials are on the River City Board. That to me is a very blatant conflict of interest. Uh, so I'm hoping that our city council and county commission can correct that. Well, and another interesting thing, we have a really good new member of the Health, Education, and Housing Board, and guess what? She's on the board of River City. Um, Helen, yesterday Tim Boyd read the requirements to qualify for a pilot, mm -hmm. and it appeared, and he, he almost declared that they, those two last two projects didn't qualify for a pilot. I think you could you could argue that either way. Yes, state law talks about low and moderate income persons. It doesn't mention workforce housing. It doesn't mention student housing. But I don't know that in a lawsuit you would prevail because typically the court will give latitude to local governments in, in how they interpret things. So, I mean, I agree. I don't think this is what this program was intended for when the legislature carved out this thing. But could you prove it? I don't know. Alan, there's a question over there. Yes, there is. Uh, question over here. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to make a comment first. Thank you very much. I appreciate your what I consider to be your very even-handed approach uh, to releasing the information and what you're doing. I have, I have one question that probably doesn't mean anything, no impact, but it's simply a matter of curiosity. Do elected officials bear a fiduciary responsibility to the citizens that they represent? For example, a fiduciary is a person that is bound to act on the behalf of a third party disregarding other interests. So do elected officials bear a fiduciary responsibility to the citizens? Now, I have no idea. I don't know. 
I would almost guarantee you they don't, and even if they did, it probably wouldn't make any difference. But, now I have another question. <clears throat> State of New York is running ads in Tennessee, and they're saying, come to New York, <clears throat> pay no taxes. Your employees will pay no state income taxes. Now, I looked that up on the internet, and it has to be tied into the university system in New York in some way, and I'm sure there are myriad requirements. But for me, what I'm trying to decide is what should the citizens, the taxpayers, and the representatives in the state of Tennessee be doing to foster uh, economic growth in the state? And I don't have a clue. Now, I'll offer an editorial comment that giving money to uh, Coca-Cola is not it, you know. But what should we be doing? And you make such a good point there. Your first question is above my pay grade, you know, about the fiduciary thing. I mean, I believe that our elected officials try to do what they think is in the best interest of the people they represent. I do fundamentally believe that. But they are obviously got lots of influences. This, this, this... You raise such a good point. I mean, I wish that we could be strategic. I wish we had a pot of money that somebody that's incredibly bright and fair and everything else could infuse something with on an as-needed basis type thing. I mean, in other words, I think there is a role. I, I think we do need to be able to, at times, contribute to some of these projects. The way we're doing it through pilots, I don't think is the answer. And particularly when they're automatic and particularly when we're not assessing public benefit and particularly when we don't think they need them. But as to what is the answer, what should the, the role of, you know, of the, what should we be doing because we all know how important jobs are. Another thing I'd like to see us do when we come up with policies is that we look at the kinds of jobs we're incentivizing. I mean, we are giving pilots to companies that pay 10 and $12 an hour. Really? I mean, is this the kind of job that we, you know, it, it's one thing if, if they're going to be something that really could contribute, but a lot of these don't. So anyway, that's, that's a, a long way of saying those are great questions, and I wish I knew the answers. And, you know, I think there is a role for, for government, but it's not the way we're currently doing it. And we need, if we're going to be doing it at all, we need to be explaining why we're doing it. You know, here are the reasons, it's called findings of fact. You know, we feel like this has public benefit because, you know, enlist five different things. So people at least know why we're doing what we're doing. Are there other approaches? Uh, does anybody really have this figured out? I don't think so. One of the things I've heard mentioned is that a lot of regions sort of form some agreements that say we won't compete with each other. It's interesting that we got an Amazon facility at the same time Bradley County did, but our subsidy package was greater in Hamilton County than in Bradley County because we are just so conditioned to whatever you want. I mean, sometimes I wonder if we don't even suggest the tax break. Yes? You know, it's like, I think they're so used to being such a bad city that now all of a sudden that people want to be here, and I don't have that much to say, but it's like they feel like they have to beg people to come here. We're not playing hard to get at all. Like, we're a great city. <laughs> That's all. Right. I think we're going back to Walter Cronkite's 1969 world's, you know, dirtiest city, and we feel like we have to do this in order to get people to come here. I mean, it's, it's, it's nothing. I am a newcomer to this, and I just want to say, because I was just sworn in last September, um, I reached out to the Chamber of Commerce um, when this first pilot came up. Because in my mind, when we issue a pilot, they are making a significant investment in Chattanooga. There is tremendous public benefit through the creation of jobs, and they have to make standards. They have to uh, be creating a significant number of jobs and um, like you said too, they also have to be paying their employees at a certain pay level as well, not the 10 and $12 an hour. So when this housing pilot came before the commission, 
Um, I actually reached out to the Chamber of Commerce. Um, I have some friends over there, and they actually negotiate uh, to bring businesses here. They're on the front lines with these pilots. And they, they shared with me, they actually sent me uh, information on the last three pilots that we issued. And it was all, all three were creating a significant number of jobs, but they shared with me. They said, Sabrina, 10 years ago, we had to use pilots to get people to come into Chattanooga. Today is very different. They said, we do not have to use these pilots like we're using them now. We are giving away too much. And this came from a fellow that is on the front lines out trying to bring business to Chattanooga and negotiating these pilots um, when they be. But he, he said that. So we have to scale back. And to me, the, this housing pilot is so black and white. There's not even a gray area that I can even make an argument in support of it. Because one thing, there is no public benefit. If we were taking the housing pilot and we were going to an area, as you mentioned early, earlier, a blighted area, an area that needed some help, and we were actually helping uh, a community of low-income citizens that couldn't afford housing. I mean, we're doing that through the uh, Greater Chattanooga Association of Realtors, through Habitat for Humanity. I don't understand, I mean, we're doing nothing to help a problem anywhere. The way I see it is, what we're doing is we're increasing the profit margin for these developers. That's bottom line. Yeah. Any other questions? I have a question. I just have one. one question. Um, you, usually as a, as a pilot, does something that you start something to come from the ground up? I mean, that's a pilot. At some point, you know the history on this, the pilots, as far as when it started and was it to initially just to start things? Because I've, I've been, I'm working at this state for the last 30 years, and what I see happening is they start, there's no Stephen Covey going on. I mean, it's not like we begin with the end of night, it's begin. And then as we go, we evolve, and then eventually nobody knows what they're doing. So. You know, you make such a good point, uh, and, and I think government is characteristically better at starting programs than ending them. I mean, I don't uh, stop and ask that question about what are we doing here, and maybe has this served its time. I think the pilot program clearly started relative to jobs. It started back, maybe one of the first pilots was for DuPont, back in who knows when, maybe even the 70s. So I think the program has been around that long. And, but I don't think that really the, you know, we have different people in office, both at the elected official level and the staff level, and they're never given any kind of a history of, you know, context about this is the program, this is what we're trying to do, uh, this is, these are some of the things we recommend you do differently. And what I think, I really kind of think local government is sort of, abdicating its responsibility that if you want to let the chamber, let's say, run the jobs program because they're very good at it, and I think they are. But I think the elected officials ought to be setting the policies and say, here, chamber, this is what we want you, and rather than talk about the chamber black box or matrix or magic eight ball, and, and I don't mean to say that that it's that casual. I mean, I, I think they, they do ask some questions, but we don't know who does the negotiation. So I would like to see the elected officials, you know, set the parameters, set the policies, set the procedures, and I wouldn't be surprised if the chamber might not like that, might like that too. And then there's always something that doesn't quite fit where, you know, kind of like a variance and zoning. So, you know, those kind of things can, can be, could be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. But if we have generally good policies and procedures, we'd all be done. See, I also think that you're on the right, uh, the right track, but that lawsuits won't do it and anger won't do it. But if you give somebody a solution mm -hmm. and let them have a way out, get out to the talking about developing something, give them something to start with so that they go, oh, I didn't know that's the way it was. Uh -huh. so, yeah. That's a problem, and you said this too, no one's policing that. And when we were asked in our agenda session before this went to a vote, it was just astonishing to me. No one could answer the question. Who's policing this? This is a big problem. 
And I almost feel like, and I want to thank you, Helen, for everything you've done on this because you've just brought so much to life, and I mean that with such sincerity. Uh, but I feel like there almost has to be a public outcry mm -hmm. to get the attention of the elected officials. Mm -hmm. One last question over here. Yeah, let, me, let me ask one quick one. Uh, you know the old saying that a rising tide lifts all boats? And I think I have the rising tide from Volkswagen has been imperceptible to me. I don't see it. Uh, is Volkswagen been a good deal? or a so-so deal for the county and the area. And I would think that if it's really produced a significant rising tide that the Chamber of Commerce, for example, would be offer clearing, uh, clear demonstration that Volkswagen has raised the tide for everyone in this area. But I don't see it. I don't see the rising tide. Their suppliers weren't here. Their suppliers are coming in with the second line. That's where the real, that's where you're going to see the top. And yeah. another thing though, like, like I said earlier, that suppliers are coming in. That's good. That's more jobs. Hopefully those are good jobs. But then are we going to give them pilots too when they're coming here because Volkswagen's here. So, you know, trying to demonstrate, I mean, it was, it's one of the, you know, biggest subsidies in state history. It's like $300 million at the state level and $300 million at the local level. And we gave them land. And my, my theory on Volkswagen is we probably needed to offer an incentive, but did we need to give them the sun, the moon, and the stars, maybe just the sun and the moon, you know. You know I but, sat down and calculated the wages at Volkswagen. I guess it took me a few years to really do that. The wages at Volkswagen aren't that high. You know, you take a blue collar worker and he does okay if his wife is a school teacher. So I've been, Volkswagen has been a, has been a disappointment to me. And another thing too, that like with, with Amazon, there are a lot of people that aren't full-time employees that don't get benefits. And we're incentivizing those. They use temporary agencies. Is that right? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Average wages at Volkswagen County benefits is forty-six dollars an hour. Well, that's pretty good. You know, that's that's significant. Average that's wages in Germany for Volkswagen County benefits is seventy-one dollars an hour. That's why they move. Yeah. Yeah. But, so it's a big plus. And I can, I can move here test to because they do not have, they do not have to shift. I can attest to let's, hey, let's, let's have this conversation. I, I've got a few. I mean, it's, it's nothing. It's let's nothing. focus back up here just for a minute. Let, let's all thank uh, Ms. Sharp for uh, a great presentation. <laughs> I really appreciate um, Helen you coming and sharing and uh, enlightening us as to the battle you've been fighting as well as uh, maybe some things we could be doing. And uh, while I'm finishing up, Tony's going to pass the bucket to help us pay for this meeting room tonight. Uh, you know, I wanted to talk about just some final points uh, along with what uh, Helen has been talking about. First of all, you've heard her talk about Mayor Coppinger uh, quite a bit, and it's interesting that Coppinger has been behind the scenes one of the most ardent supporters of these pilots, and of course he sits on the board. But here's what he had to say about another business. Um, the reason you got scared a few minutes ago is I was trying to splice this movie real quickly together to show it to you. It's only about 15 seconds of a speech he gave last week. Uh, he was speaking at the grand opening of Morning Point Assisted Living, which is over on Shallowford Road, a brand new facility. This particular uh, building uh, facility was up right at a $9 million investment by uh, Greg Vidal and Franklin Farrell, two great guys, good friends of mine. They built uh, a lot of properties around the southeast. They built five properties in, in Hamilton County. Um, and interestingly enough, the Choo Choo Pilot, uh, Choo Choo Development is right about the same dollar amount, $8 million. Now, Greg Vidal got nothing, not one dime, to develop that property. He happened to mention that in his speech 
at the grand opening. Now listen what uh, uh, Mayor Coppinger had to say about that same thing here at the same time. Hopefully this will come through. Now don't get too excited. That's not Mayor Coppinger. That's the guy that we all love uh, that was speaking just before him. But listen up. Job. Five facilities here in Hamilton County. And what those five facilities do for Hamilton County is provide a tremendous amount of jobs. Um, they make capital investment. And yes, uh, Greg's exactly right. They do it on their own. And for the group. Okay, what was the last thing he said? They do it on their own, right? Which is exactly how each one of you do it. You do it on your own. You don't go ask, asking for a handout, but for whatever reason, again, I say it's a political cronyism that exists that uh, someone felt he was entitled to half a million dollar tax break and he didn't do it on his own. And he did renovate his property for 27 years and it was run down. You know, we went to that property to look at it last year to hold a, a conference for our for uh, a meeting we were going to have for our group, and I tell you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't stay in that hotel. Hotel, I wouldn't entertain a meeting there. And I'm not knocking Mayor Kinsey. I'm just saying it was in much need of repair, in much need of renovation. And that's great. He wants to do it. Just don't ask us to do it. So I think it's interesting that Mayor Coppinger took a minute to credit and praise a local businessman who did it on his own. Yet behind the scenes, he's trying to promote using your tax dollars to help um, a former mayor who was actually his former boss and the IRS particularly came after and uh, we were in Washington DC along with uh, 40 others suing the IRS because of their attack specifically on the Chattanooga Tea Party. That's a battle that's still going on. That's a battle that I don't think we'll ever win honestly in terms of getting to the bottom of what happened. The good news, though, is this battle here locally is one that I think can be won because it's local and because each one of those politicians that voted so easily and eagerly to give away your tax dollars have to still look at us eyeball to eyeball every single week. But it will take more than Helen Sharp. It'll take more than Sabrina and Tim. It'll take every one of us to continue to alert our friends and our network and our neighbors about what's going on because most of them don't know about it. Everyone I have talked to is opposed to it, but there's so many more that don't know about it. That goes kind of off the press. Okay, Count, yeah, okay, so this is, this is the repercussions that uh, actually I have written an article and others have done the same thing and I think Helen has too. This is the repercussions of what these kind of uh, tax giveaways will ultimately end up doing. Uh, and Sabrina just handed me this headline, County School Officials Present Budget Requiring a 40 Cent County Property Tax Increase. Okay. And do you think they had $26 million last year? Or $13 million? Or $7 million? That they would be asking for that? That's a new school. Yeah. They, they wouldn't be asking for it. And so the point is, we have to uh, we have to push forward on these issues and demand that our elected officials stop having, as a, one young lady said, a poor self-esteem about our city, about our county. We've got a great county. It's one of the top counties in the state. I'd say it's one of the top counties in the country. And uh, people want to live here. They want to come here. And there's no need to give away the farm as has happened. Yes, sir, Larry. Well. That isn't totally accurate because all of the pilots still require all of these companies to still pay all of the school taxes. This is true, but the, what, it, what, they, what they are still giving away is tremendous amounts of dollars, Larry. They're giving away, as she just pointed out, $26 million. As was just pointed out on the Choo Choo pilot, we're giving away a half a million dollars. And, that, and that's going to the bottom line of the developer, bottom line. And I think there's an article that's about to come out. I just proved it from one of my friends. Uh, I hate to steal his thunder, but it is a great example, and I'll close with this example. The example is that, you know, when you and I run over a, run into one of these potholes that's around our community, and they're all over the place, we all gripe and complain about it. We see them all over the place, which is the infrastructure of our community crumbling. And why is that crumbling? because there's not sufficient tax dollars. They've been diverted elsewhere. 
So when you and I run into one of those potholes and perhaps we get a flat tire, we bend our wheel, or it does some damage to our car, most of us can go out and fix it. It's not going to change our lives significantly. But what about that low income individual, okay, who their car is bandaged together, okay, it's barely making it, and they hit that pothole, and all of a sudden, they've got an extra several hundred dollar expense to pay for that. And they now have to decide, how do I pay for that? How do I get to work now? And what? If we hadn't given away the farm, we would have had the money to fix that pothole. And that low-income individual wouldn't ultimately have paid for this, which ultimately he paid for it. And guess who got it? Mayor John Kinsey as an addition to his bottom line. So I see, see these are the repercussions that we really, you and I won't really see. It won't impact us, but it will impact our fellow citizen who is struggling. So I think that's why, folks, we've got to step forward. We've got, we can't let this issue just go away. We can't let it die down. We have to continue to be that burr under, under the saddle in a positive way to achieve the results that are the right results, that are the fair results in my mind. So I, I want to end with a positive note. This has been, a, I think it's been a positive meeting, but I think we have so much to be thankful for in this country. Even though we're fighting a little battle here, we still have a lot to be, to be thankful for. So I want to end with a little video, a music video that I, I ran across a few days ago. And to me, it was very inspirational. And I hope it will be that for you too. And it will, it will maybe hope uh, cause some pride to swell up in you, not just about the fact that we do live in Austin County, even though we're fighting some battles with some politicians, but ultimately we still live in a great country. So let's close with this little video here.